Okay, how about we get started? My name is Lori Henderson and I'm the Director of Research and Data Partnerships at Great Schools. I'm joined by John Dean, our CEO at Great Schools, and Orville Jackson, our VP of Data Strategy. He and our data science team have led our ratings work to develop the Evolve methodology that we're going to be discussing today. So here's our agenda. We'll start off with a message from John. And then we'll talk about how our ratings have evolved over the last three years. We'll offer some context about, about why we're making another change. We'll describe those ratings in depth. Um, we'll share results of the updated methodology. And then lastly, we'll round out our time together by sharing out some next steps and answering whatever questions you might have. So to kick us off, I'm gonna pass it to John Dean, our CEO, for a quick message about who we are and why we made these changes. Thanks, Lori. Uh, welcome, everyone. At Great Schools, we equip millions of parents, regardless of zip code and household income, with essential information to demand and support high-quality learning outcomes in their homes, schools, and communities. You know, Great Schools has been doing this work for more than 20 years. We've evolved so much of what we do over the years, but a few things remain consistent. We focus on parents and do our best to make all of the information we provide from school data to parenting tips and guidance as accessible and actionable as possible. We use the best information we can to paint the broadest picture of schools. And we listen to parents, to researchers, to others in the field, to many of you to continually improve what we do. All three of those factors come together to, in what we're sharing today. That's why I'm so excited uh, to be here with you all. We're gonna be talking about our new ratings. Um, we're really excited by the improvements we've made, and Lori and Orville will go into that in just a moment and share that with you. But I want to just acknowledge that today is not a stopping point for us. This is a step on our journey, on a learning process as we all move together uh, in this work. And I want to thank you all for being here uh, with us today on this journey. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Orville. Thanks, John. Um, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm excited to share more about our improved ratings with you. Um, but before I do that, I also want to share some context about why we made this update and the motivation behind this work. At grade schools, we're working hard to provide the best information we can to paint the broadest picture possible of schools. And I like to think of this as expanding our aperture. As John mentioned, we're continually evolving our work based on our conversations with parents, researchers, educators, and others in the field. Based on those conversations, we saw an opportunity to strengthen our focus on equity and make sure that our ratings are reflecting more of the experience of the most underserved students. This meant looking at more than just test score outcomes and developing an equity rating that was more holistic. And with regard to measures, even since 2017, the conversation and understanding of measures of school quality has shifted. We've learned more as a field, and in particular, there's an increasing emphasis on the importance of growth measures as a more valid measure of how schools are serving all students. Finally, I wanna emphasize again that this is not new work, but work we've been engaged in all along, from our initial school directories to our shift from test-based ratings to a summary rating, and now these next steps. This is a chance to start bringing a broader framework for organizing how we think and talk about school quality that reflects how the different measures relate to each other. For example, distinguishing between things like resources and funding uh, versus outcomes like growth or high school graduation. I'll share more about that framework later, but first I wanna talk about uh, uh, more about how we've evolved our ratings over time. As millions of parents visit greatschools.org each year, it's imperative that we continually refine and evolve our understanding of how schools are serving all students. From our original ratings, based mainly on test scores, we shifted in 2017 to a multiple measure summary rating that incorporated information on growth, equity, and other measures. And now after conducting a review of the available data and incorporating the perspectives of experts in academia, education policy, 
civil rights and parent facing organizations, we've developed a new methodology that focuses on two key measures, our equity rating and our summary rating. The new equity rating will now include student growth and college readiness metrics in addition to proficiency measures. And the summary rating will also shift to emphasize student growth relative to standardized test scores. So with that background, I'd like to share an overview of those specific changes in those two key measures. So what changed? In terms of our equity rating, we've expanded to include information on student growth in states where that information is available or our growth proxy measures in places where we can apply that measure. We've also included college readiness measures such as high school graduation and college entrance exam performance where available. And in the past, we've calculated an equity adjustment factor for schools that didn't have sufficient populations of underserved students. Moving forward, we'll no longer be applying that adjustment factor to those schools. With regard to our summary rating, we're increasing the relative importance of growth information and equity information in the overall rating. We had also applied in the past a small weight for discipline and attendance information. We're still going to be sharing that information on our school profiles, but those data will no longer impact the school's overall summary rating. And finally, we're placing limits on how much the amount of information available can actually uh, influence the weight of a particular measure. This next slide shows a table that's just a visual representation of how our weights are changing. So you can see here that we're having increases to growth, growth proxy, and equity information, and relative decreases to the weights for test score ratings and college readiness information, as well as the removal of the weights for discipline and attendance information and the equity adjustment factor. Now with those changes, a school summary rating will always be weighted most by growth and equity will have an equal impact with the other inputs. So now I'd like to share some results and some of the patterns that we're seeing that are based on those changes that we've made. So did ratings go up or down and for which schools? This table shows a national overview of the shifting patterns for our school ratings. So first, a couple of definitions. The columns in this table are broken out into high need versus low need schools. We defined high need schools as those schools that are serving a higher than average population of students from disadvantaged racial or ethnic groups or students from low income backgrounds relative to their state. Now what we saw in terms of our ratings shifts based on our new methods is that high need schools had a higher average increase in their equity rating compared to low need schools. We also saw that high need schools had an average increase in their summary rating compared to low need schools as well. The average increase for high need schools in their equity rating was about a quarter of a point compared to about a tenth of a point for low need schools. And the average summary rating increase for high need schools was around 0.2 points versus a relative decrease of about two tenths of a point for low need schools. So that's an overview of some of the high level patterns that we saw with these changes. But as we mentioned, this is a continuing effort. Um, this isn't a stopping point, and we're continuing to evolve our understanding of the information that we can bring to bear on how we understand and think about school quality. So I'd like to share some of that thinking now. As part of our work, we regularly engage in formal and informal conversations with a wide range of folks who are thinking about school quality. And this, this graphic is really, uh, an effort to synthesize a lot of that thinking into a broader framework for how we can continue to expand our aperture. Looking at a broader range of information about schools. It reflects our efforts to begin differentiating between the types of information we share, which we've broken into three broad categories. Resources, uh, and th this includes things like funding, staffing, and facilities. All the things that 
that schools can bring to, to the table to support students. What we're calling practices is the things that are going on in the school from the rigor of the courses to the climate in the classrooms and the halls that can support student outcomes. And finally, a category for those outcomes as well, with an understanding that outcomes goes way beyond just academics, but can include things like social emotional well being and other outcomes. Now we know that there's no comprehensive national data source on all of these measures, but just because those things aren't measured doesn't mean that they don't matter, which is why we're also continuing our work to push for transparency and a deeper understanding of how these measures relate to each other and support better outcomes for all students. So with that, I'll hand it over to Lori who can talk a little bit more about our other work. Thank you so much, Orville. We are really excited about these updates. And as you mentioned, we have a lot of work to do. Um, there are a lot of friends on our call today from researchers to advocacy organizations and everything in between. So before we move to Q&A, I really just wanna invite you to work with us. Um, maybe you have a research question that you're working on and you'd like to license our data, or maybe you want to continue this conversation regarding how the ratings work in your own community or even equity more broadly in your community. We really thrive on partnership and all the work that each of you do is much more meaningful when we do it together. So I invite you to join us as we move into the next stage of this work. And with that, I wanna open it up for Q&A. Um, we have a Q&A little box at the bottom of your screen. So if you could use that to pop some questions in, now is the time. Um, I have a question to start with and um, we'll, we'll get us started there. And then if you come up with more questions, feel free to message us after the call. Um, maybe you need a little more time to marinate on what we've shared today. So let's get started. Um, OJ, some people might be wondering if test scores are so highly correlated with race and income, why include them at all? Doesn't the test score just reflect demographics? This question is for either Orville or John. Thanks, Lori. I, sorry, I see John unmuting there. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that, um, or at least get us started on that conversation. Um, what we do know is that um, whether or not students are uh, performing at grade level uh, is very important. Um, and we also know that growth and how much students are learning over a given period uh, is a very uh, important factor uh, in how much a school is contributing to their, their outcomes. Um, and we think our new rating uh, with its emphasis on growth uh, is a step in the right direction. Um, we also know that there are lots of, uh, lots of measures of school quality um, and we're pushing for more information on things that we can uh, incorporate that uh, reflect the value that schools are adding for students. And I would just add to, uh, to what Orville responded, we know that they're in a very important element of understanding how, uh, how a school is doing for all parents. And so we have to make sure that's there. But as this acknowledges, we, we recognize that other elements kind of rise to that. And so this is an evolution in the process of, of continuing to make better sense of what we have. And we, we think we've got a better balance here. So it's really important for us to, to make this change. Thank you. I have a question that came in, two questions actually. I'll start with the second. Instead of having an equity measure that compares outputs, which has non-school causes, why not simply evaluate the inputs? Does a school have socioeconomic diversity? You could reward schools that fall within a band compared to the district or national population, such as 35 to 75% free or reduced lunch or the likelihood that a given student would have certain number of students of another race or class in their grade level? It's a great question. Um, 
we think it's important for our equity rating to really focus on the experience and outcomes for the most underserved students. And we believe that our, our current equity rating as it's structured does a great job of that. It looks not just at gaps within performance for students within a given school, but also how, how the most underserved students are performing relative to all students within a given state. Um, and we, we really like that um, in order to really shine a lens on the experience of those students. Um, we also know that there is a very complex relationship between school diversity and who attends a school and the experience of students at that school. Um, we differentiate between those things. Um, and that is a part of the reason why, uh, for shifting to our broader framework for understanding school quality and thinking about how uh, factors such as the resources of a school uh, or the practices within a school contribute to the outcomes of students. Um, there's no simple straightforward answer, um, but we're doing our best to dig in and understand these patterns and present that information in a way that really helps reflect uh, the experience that students are having uh, and how schools are, are, are working towards supporting students for better outcomes. Thanks, OJ. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna add in because I, I think we were about to unmute at the same time there. I, I, in this process, I think the, the other thing to, to note is uh, there are about as many different models for considering what this looks like as, as there are ways to think about it and talk about it here and so you know we are deep in in our own research on understanding what this looks like and taking all the factors that that Orville just mentioned and I think this is a, a great place for us to you know just continue to to learn as to what's uh, what's most effective here and um, you know I guess again what the data is showing us and what we can see so we'll, we'll continue to both evolve our own understanding of this and, and kind of engage in dialogue with you all about what uh, what's out there and I think it's a, a great opportunity to keep learning. Thank you. I have one more question. I'm eager for more from uh, folks who are on, but I'll read out this question as more hopefully roll in. The previous equity measure compared performance among groups, but didn't reward schools with diversity or penalize those without. Why? Because performance unfortunately largely correlates with wealth and privilege, this penalized schools that have achieved socioeconomic diversity within their school because they had big discrepancies. On the other hand, schools with only rich kids got a free pass for having too few students to do the comparative measures. Any thoughts on that you can share? Why don't, why don't you take this first, John, and I'll, yeah, I'll chime in. <laughs> I think this is, is very similar to the, to the last question in the, in the underlying um, response here, which is we are really deeply looking at what this measure looks like and how that equity measure captures uh, captures gaps in performance and, and really get, paints a clear picture of how the school is doing serving all students. And so that's what's really important. We think the evolution of what we had previously to where we are now is a really great step forward and we're gonna to continue to learn. Uh, and I think that's the most important step here. Um, uh, or well, you could, if, you, if you'd like to respond a little bit about uh, what we've seen in the, in the differences in uh, distributions, that's okay. But uh, I think what you said before fairly captures what, we're, what the question is on the table here. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's important to understand that our equity rating uh, involves two factors. Uh, the first is that 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 gap, the the measure of disparities in performance within a given school, um, and those gaps. Uh, let's be clear; don't always correlate with the population of the school itself, um, and so. It's important to look specifically at those gaps. Our equity rating also includes a, a measure of the overall performance of disadvantaged students within a school relative to all. And so that's more of a sort of objective uh, criterion based measure. Um, and so we think it's important to include that as well. Um, one of the steps that we've taken is incorporating more measures into our equity rating. Um, which we think and we know based on the outcomes um, actually highlights the performance of those high need schools that I think this question is really sort of focused on. Um, 
we've seen that by incorporating more measures into our equity rating, um, the, the ratings for those higher need schools, schools serving a more disadvantaged population, have actually increased more. Um, so again, I think this is sort of directionally in the right, in the right direction. Um, and, you know, as we mentioned, we're doing even more to sort of uncover more of these metrics that can shine a light on the efforts that schools are, are making in terms of serving uh, uh, disadvantaged populations better. Thank you so much, Orville. Really appreciate you answering that question. I have um, one more question I want to ask um, from the Q&A. Um, and this question is, there are several ways that we could measure school quality. Why not allow parents to personalize their own weights according to what they value, for example? I'll jump in on that, and, and Orville, or you can uh, tag in. Uh, I, I, I fully agree. There are several ways to do this, and we put together what we believe is a great starting point for parents to use as they go through an exploration of understanding schools. Um, we never say that the great schools rating and the information we provide is the only source they should have. We say it's a starting point for them to, to jump off and, uh, and begin their exploration. We really believe that there are a lot of inputs they should have, but we also know that there is a lot more information we can provide to match with what parents are asking for and what they know and what you as researchers and others in the field have um, said would be helpful inputs to school quality. I think you all know that providing that information is difficult. There, there are not a lot of great data sets on uh, school climate and some of the things that we know matter, but we're gonna try to get those and we're gonna try to continue to build tools and create models for making that data more available and more transparent. We know there's more input we could be gathering from parents and from schools themselves about what makes them unique or great, uh, really helping to understand what's going on within a school that we can use to provide that information can help parents get a more personalized or uh, individual experience. And that's something that we, we'd love to figure out how to do. But right now we've got to do that work to you know, continue to expand what is, what's available in the field and what's out there. Um, we're starting with uh, looking at some places where we can get culture and climate survey data from schools um, in, in states and districts that have that data available and continuing to work on that as a, as a beginning point. And we'll keep working from there, but we think that's a direction we can go for sure. Yeah, I guess I would add to that. Um, you know, just based on on our work, our conversations with partners, um, and our our communication with our users and the, the the parents, the millions of parents that come to our site every year, uh, we know that there are are as many different views and opinions and values around school quality as there are uh, people in this country. Um, uh, there's a broad diversity of opinions and ideas about what makes a great school. And we also know that our schools are one of our most critical common goods. Um, we all have a stake in great schools for this country, schools that can serve all of our kids well. Um, and this is an important conversation. Um, and we're excited uh, to put forth these new ratings uh, as a step and a statement in that broader conversation. Um, and, you know, I think ideally the outcome from all of this is that uh, we can all take the next steps on this learning journey about uh, how to understand what makes a great school, um, what we do know, what we don't know, um, and how we can move, move things forward to have better outcomes and experiences for every, every child in the country. Thank you, Orville. I just got a really interesting question here um, that I'm really eager to hear you all answer for our attendees. And the question is, how do you see the lack of data resulting from COVID-19 changing your ratings in the near future? This is the question on everyone's hearts and minds. Yeah. <laughs> Jump on in. So it's, a, it's on our hearts and minds as much as yours. Uh, I think um, you all know that if we had a crystal ball and everyone could ex understand what's happening this year and into the future, I think we'd all feel, uh, feel a little sense of relief from that. 
Um, but it's an open question for everybody right now. And I think that the best answer is we're, we're listening to everybody we can listen to right now, asking lots of questions, trying to stay really, uh, as up to, up to speed as we can about the, the state of things across the country um, and what will be effective this year, both in, in data that's gathered and then the best ways to use that data and, and share with parents. And so we're gonna stay, uh, stay closely aligned with, with what's going on and uh, we'll be making some decisions along the way. We have a lot of opportunity to continue evolving what we do in different ways and to expand the information we use um, to share with parents to, to you know, continue to meet our mission of empowering parents. And so uh, with that as the, the ultimate goal, we'll continue to drive through that um, and uh, we'll adjust to the circumstances as they are. And if any of you do have that crystal ball, just let us know, okay? <laughs> Thank you, John. Well, it looks like I've hit the end of the questions for now. Oh, actually, I just got one more. I think we have time to take it. Let's see. Um, okay, one last question and then we'll close out. Here we go. Along the lines of an earlier question about personalization, have you considered allowing a user to provide their demographic information so that GS could customize the likely outcome? For example, most privileged parents don't realize that their kid probably per will perform well at any school. If they identify themselves as upper middle class, it would educate them to see that their kid would do fine at a more diverse school, and thus they don't need to self-segregate by going to a school with concentrated wealth. Great question. That's a great question. There, uh, thanks for the question. I think we... Uh, what I'll say is we consider a lot of opportunities to figure out how best to empower parents and parents of all income levels, regardless of zip code, regardless of where they are, what school they're assigned to, or whether they have choice. Our goal is to always find that information that helps them make the best choices for where they are. And so in, our, in the evolution of what we've done, we've made, made changes up to this point. And we'll continue to look at the best ways to do that. Um, I think there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of pros and cons with lots of different opportunities. And so we, we consider a lot of uh, different paths forward and um, we will always hold as our North Star that ability to get that information to parents to be able to, um, to empower and support their kids. So uh, anything along that direction is something we'll definitely consider. Well, thank you all so much for being here. I'm really excited about the questions that were asked. I think if you are on this call and you are asking questions, then you're probably the perfect person to partner with us. So again, um, here's our contact information. Please reach out to us if you have questions that come up for you or research questions that you'd like to partner with us um, to get answered. We'd love to hear from you. If you're a researcher, you've used the email on the left, research at greatschools.org. And if you're a partner currently or someone who is just really interested in our data and the effect of it, and you just want to continue the conversation, email us at partnerships at greatschools.org. We want to continue talking to all of you. Um, we're really excited about this rollout and we have so much work to do. So you are instrumental in, in uh, helping us get there in the next stages of our rating. So please reach out and um, thank you all so much for being here. We'll send out the recording to participants. Um, and with that, we'll say goodbye. <laughs> thank you all so much. Have a great day. <laughs>